back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Will Brexit bring pesticides back to the UK? We've got that question slash story, plus gene editing in Japan and big vaccine news out of Italy on this jam-packed episode. But first, Tokyo convenience store chain Lawson tests fried chicken dispensing robot. Major convenience store chain Lawson Incorporated began experimenting with a hot and ready food dispensing robot that looks like its famous mascot, I might mangle this, James. I might have to ask you for help in some of this. Karagi-kun at an outlet in Tokyo. The robot, Decitate, which means ready to eat, Karagi-kun Robo, can prepare food quickly as well as increase efficiency among workers. Depending on the results of this first trial, it may be used to make other kinds of fried foods as well. The robot is equipped with state-of-the-art technology that allows it to fry food in just over a minute. Originally, it used to take six whole minutes to prepare the food, which was kept warm until the customer made an order. Since the new robot's faster, the food is prepared after the order is placed and served fresh, made to order. Lawson president said he wants to maximize efficiency and minimize food preparation time. The trial, which is only held during the daytime, will run until December 28th at the Lawson outlet location inside the TOC Osaki building near Osaki Station. James, we will include in the show notes a wildly entertaining video of Karagi-kun Robo selling fresh finished items. James? Yeah, what I find in, pretty much nothing about this story is interesting, but what the one thing that I do find interesting about this is that when you look at that video, this is not a robot by any stretch of the imagination or any mangling of that word. This is not a robot. This is a glorified vending machine with a little cute face, whatever, computer face, to wink at you while you're, while you yourself put, uh, uh, at least the, the video shows, someone putting the, the pack in so that they can get the, the chicken out. I mean, it's like, what, what, what is robotic about this? But I find that interesting because although this Karaege-kun, this uh, Dekitate Karaege-kun, is not in my local Lawson, uh, unfortunately. Oh, I'll let you know when it comes, guys. Um, but recently, uh, there's a new shopping complex thing that opened up near us um, that had a bookstore with a little cafe in the back, and the cafe had this robotic uh, barista, basically. But barista in the and in the lowest sense of that word, it was literally just a robot that that took the cup and put it in the machine and pushed a button and then got you the cup afterwards. That's essentially all it did. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was stupid. But the guy that was there, I guess, like, minding the, the robot or whatever, was so excited, and he could speak English, so he was talking to me. Oh, hey, did you see this? Wow, there's only two of these in Japan, and one of them is here. It's so cool. I'm like, there's nothing cool at all about this. But I did take a video, so we'll put that on screen for people to watch. That uh, whole process. Uh, clearly, this is just PR. This is propaganda rollout for the coming robotic robotic uh, workers of the society of the future, where you're not going to be interfacing with humans when you go to the convenience store or you go to the cafe or you go to any of your regular stops. You're going to be interfacing with glorified robots or glorified vending machines, essentially. James, it doesn't usually take a whole lot to make me think of The Simpsons, but as you were talking about sort of the robot minder there, it reminds me of, you know, when, when Homer joins the military and they're graduating, he's talking about, or maybe it's when the kids are in military school. Your job in the future is to build and maintain those robots, which will be fighting all your wars. Uh, I've got a little fun bit of compare and contrast for you, something I talked about on my morning show this morning. Ohio State's Agriculture School gets a new bacon vending machine funded by and stocked by Big Pork, Smithfield, and Hormel, and the others. So compare the sort of energetic and goofy Japanese chicken vending machines with the obviously staged photos of schlubby college kids lined up for American bacon vending machine. But remember, it's fun to obey the machine. Our second story this week on Good News. Or no, I'm sorry. I, I mix this up often now, James. I, I do the same thing on the Good News Next Week episodes. Our second segment on this New World Next Week, episode 360, swirls around the ever-changing Brexit drama, the latest of which is Prime Minister May surviving a vote of confidence today. But an important question we might not have thought about. I certainly hadn't thought about it yet. Consumer advocates say UK unprepared to regulate pesticides 
after Brexit. Existing agencies in the United Kingdom are unprepared to handle pesticide issues after Brexit, according to the Pesticide Action Network in the UK. A briefing paper from that charity said the way the UK chooses to govern pesticides after leaving the European Union next year will have implications for the health of UK citizens. The EU's pesticide regulations are considered to be the strongest in the world to protect human health, and for decades, the way the UK regulates and uses pesticides has, of course, largely been decided at the European level. Pan-UK, the Pesticide Action Network UK said the government could choose to mirror the relatively high standards of the EU or introduce additional measures to reduce pesticide use. However, it could use Brexit as the chance to, of course, deregulate, allowing a greater variety of pesticides to be used on UK farms and permitting larger quantities in domestically grown and imported foods. There's a pretty massive kind of collection of PDFs and research surrounding this at foodresearch.org.uk. And of course, everything we say and play always included down in the show notes. Brexit and pesticides, UK food and agriculture at a crossroads. And James, I think as we kind of talked about this last week, our whole sort of Gattaca, you know, nightmare scenario, we were talking about all the DNA and the editing last week and, and those scientists. little related story right here. Japan may boost gene-edited foods development. A health ministry panel said that most of the foods currently under development using genome editing can be marketed without, safely, without safety screening by the state. So in some ways, gene editing humans is bad, but gene editing all kinds of food with CRISPR is going to be A-OK. James? Yeah, apparently that's a that's a worrying and, and really disheartening development because Japan has been very good on the GM issue, not allowing GMO foods into the food supply, but allowing gene edited foods and not even with any special regulatory approval process. That's that's pretty worrying. And so I'll obviously have my eye on that and give you the front row seat as to the developments on that front. But uh, with regards to the EU and pesticides, uh, yes, this is, again, a, another worrying potential foot in the door for big food and big agra to worm their way in with, uh, with and of course, Mon Bear Santo and all of that to worm their way in with more pesticides to sell to the farmers and uh, as the EU bans get lifted. But uh, I, I want to see it from the other perspective. Decentralization is always to the good because if you're in the EU and the EU issues a blanket regulation allowing a certain amount of chemical X and you don't like chemical X, what are you going to do as an average EU citizen? I mean, you're not a citizen of the EU. You don't have any direct input into what the EU does in its grand body that's deciding continental uh, pesticide regulations. You at least have some little bit more leverage over your local national government. And if you could make that even further down the local level, you would have greater influence. Again, it's still a rigged process, but it, it's at least a little less rigged. Um, so... I, again, we'll have to wait to see what actually happens, if Brexit even occurs, I mean, and in what state it occurs to, before we start thinking about pesticide regulations. But on the other side of it, I mean, however the good, the good the EU might be compared to other places in terms of its pesticide regulations, well, what about GM, uh, GMO crops and GMO foods, which the EU does allow. There are certain EU-approved GM crops that Scotland a couple of years ago, had to issue their own ban of certain crops that were actually allowed in EU that they said, no, we're not going to do that. I'll put a link back to a video that I did a couple of years ago on that uh, Scotland issues GM crop ban um, that goes into that issue. But, you know, it's always, always six and two threes. It's always, uh, you know, what's the difference? Things always seem to be on this teeter-totter and unfortunately again the public tends to tends to be the ones in the middle that are getting squeezed out of this and there have been there's a lot of moves being made lately on a lot of these kind of different levels and again I, i'll i'll include the link when we talk about the bacon vending machine the link will go back to my morning show from today which wednesdays i talk about food health and environment news all kinds of updates about Johnson & Johnson and their talcum powder and Monsanto and glyphosate that all the while, all the research says it's causing cancer. And even juries initially ruling that, yes, this caused your cancer, then coming out at the end and basically pulling all the money out from under them at the end. A lot of really strange stuff going on in kind of those Johnson & Johnson stories. And we've, we've been covering those in the past on New World next week. 
Our third and final story here on the penultimate episode of New World Next Week for 2018 keeps it a very food world order kind of episode. Anti-vaccine Italian government sacks entire health expert board, so says Newsweek. The vaccine-skeptic Italian government has sacked every member of the country's health advisory board, raising fears that the populist administration will sideline accepted science and inflict long-lasting damage on public health. Health Minister Giulia Grillo removed all 30 members of the Higher Health Council, arguing it's time to give space to the new. The council is the country's most prominent body of technical scientific experts who advise the government on their health policy. Grillo is a member of something we've talked about a little bit before, the Five Star Movement. That is the senior party in Italy's ruling coalition now, which has previously supported unproven cures for cancer and promised to overturn laws making vaccines mandatory for children. Explaining her decision, Grillo wrote on Fedbook, we are the hashtag government of change. And as I have already done with the appointments of the various organs and committees of the ministry, I have chosen to open the door to other deserving personalities. So, James, this will be, I think, probably a huge story that everyone will seize on maybe the moment anything kind of goes wrong to say, ah, see, we told you, you crazy anti-vaxxers are nuts. Yeah, that's right. I heard this story originally on uh, Morning Monarchy, and I heard you make that comment that they're going to use this as kind of, well, anything goes wrong, they're going to blame it on this. And unfortunately, that's the way this goes. And that's kind of a lose-lose situation, because what on earth can you ever do then? Because if you if you win, then... Whatever happens, they'll just blame anything bad on you and they'll never look at anything good that happens. So, I mean, it's a lose-lose situation. So I'm not sure we should worry about that per se, um, so much as be our own media and reflect the good things that, that might come from this. But the interesting thing about this story from my perspective is, as far as I'm aware, and unless you've seen any other information about this that, that says otherwise, but as far as I'm aware, this story has nothing explicitly to do with vaccines. There's no statement from Grillo saying this is about vaccines. There's no, there's nothing that says this is about vaccines. But Newsweek latches onto the anti-vaccine government is firing the health board, and we all know what that means. This is about vaccines. Is it really? I mean, it might. I'm sure that's part of something that's going on here. But why is it explicitly about vaccines? Why are they bringing it down to that issue in particular when this presumably has to do with a lot of different issues? I don't know. I just found that interesting, and obviously shows the the uh, big pharma bias of Newsweek and fellow MSM travelers. God, I can't, I can't remember what they are now. Fortunately, they've, they've left my mind. But when I was doing the, the show prep and getting the notes together for this, you look at Newsweek and you look at, oh, it seems like it's really serious. And then the sidebar, all their most popular articles are a bunch of clickbait, celebrity, tabloid garbage. James, speaking of making our own media, as you just mentioned, I do have the latest episode of the uh, aforementioned Good News next week. I like to call it some of the ways that we are winning with solutions-oriented stories. It's called Small Bookstores Booming Despite the Fang. Small bookstores all around America and all around the world are actually doing really well and staging a bit of a comeback in the face of our cyber overlords. Another bit of deprogramming notes, I signed up for something called Subscribestar. Subscribestar.com slash Media Monarchy is a new platform out there for crowdfunding, and it looks to be a fairly simple way that you could support independent, non-commercial alternative media. I still have the hated Patreon, PayPal, and Stripe, and this is what places like Subscribestar are rushing to fill in the void, as of course all the whack-a-mole of, of alternative media and the platforms and how to actually fund yourself, of course, still, you know, moving the deck chairs around. I still have the hated Patreon, PayPal, and Stripe, plus, of course, everybody's favorite cryptocurrency. Oh, does anybody use cryptocurrency anymore? I also have a post office box, James. So any number of ways people can support. I've been making it for 13 years. Never heard an ad, never heard a snake oil pitch. And as I like to say, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. Next week will be the big final broadcast week of the year, which leads up to not only my big best of 2018 best music mixtape of the year, but of course also our big grand finale, New World Next Year 2019, right here next week. It's the only show of the year where we don't know what each other is going to talk about. We look at our stories of the year and pick our trends for the next year. James, do you feel like you're ready for it? I'm ready. And are yeah. you ready? No. No. Only, only half. <laughs> Well, you'll be ready by next week. And 
If you're not, you can get ready by supporting the Corbett Report by buying Super Macho Man Brain Force Pill Plus. No, just kidding. No, of course, that's not how things work. Yes, no, I rely on your support too, and uh, I'll have to ask you about Subscribe store Star after we get off uh, air here, because I think I'm going to be signing up for that. Anyway, more on that later. Thank you for three great stories. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, buddy. Take care.